part one, I took a look at the Sasquatch Genome Project, which proved that Bigfoot, or at least the three individuals tested, has human mitochondrial and unknown nuclear DNA. Then in part two, I showed some fairly solid evidence of interbreeding between human and some international Bigfoot variants. In part 3 we'll have a look at some of the more bizarre aspects of these elusive creatures and their interactions with us, which could possibly be related to the unknown part of their DNA. Despite the fact that the species, or at least one variant, has been officially categorised with a fully mapped genome, the scientific community in general is resistant to researching these living hairy hominids. This didn't come as a big surprise to me, but what did was the response from many well-known researchers in the Bigfoot community, or more aptly, the Bigfoot competition. Without getting into specifics, it seems that the results of the Genome Project contradict the pet theories that some of these old-school researchers have invested a large chunk of their lives meticulously piecing together in countless books and videos as well as assuredly expounding at conferences and lectures. So sadly, once again, and I mean no offence, instead of excitement at some much needed actual progress in figuring these elusive critters out, bruised egos divide the Bigfoot competition even more, and when the average Joe stumbles upon the Sasquatch Genome Project, they're immediately put off by the condemnation of it by these big name researchers. From what I can glean off the hundreds of reports that I've read over the last year, opinion of what these things are is formed pretty much straight after the first contact, swayed slightly by the lucky human spiritual outlook. Now your average person that runs into a Sasquatch, let's say a hunter, a hiker, rarely will they ever mention anything odd. Probably 90% of your encounters, your average person will say it was an animal they ran into. More often than not, it seems that the first time seeing these giant mythical monsters is utterly terrifying. The trepidation may be compounded by territorial behaviour, and when the closest frame of reference they have is usually to an ape, the natural immediate conclusion is that these things are wild animals. So, hypothetically, if someone with a scientific background randomly crossed paths with the Sasquatch back in the day, it's only natural that they gravitate to the relic hominid hypothesis. And hypothetically, if they were more at home in a library than in the bush, they might stick to that line of inquiry long enough to knock out a book or two, likely based on the grounding of existing academic dogma mixed with extrapolation of some superficial data collected in the field, such as footprints, hair, and crap. They might be forgiven for being too busy to notice some of the more bizarre experiences shared by a new generation of researchers. They know that so-called real science, you know, uh, will never take them seriously if they talk about the weird stuff. So they, they desperately want that, like, official cryptozoologist title behind their name. And they want to talk about footprints and hair, and that's it. And uh, when you start talking about the weird stuff, they get very prickly. And uh, as, as I said on Les's show, I've actually gotten emails, like, telling me, don't talk about that stuff. You make us look like idiots, you know. Our researchers have their own little lane. So if you imagine a highway, so they don't want, you know, vehicles crossing the lanes perpendicular, just destroying everything that they've created and built because it's monetized and it's how they make their money. They defend their own lane. I think that's why we don't get into these topics. It would completely shatter the existing belief structure around cryptos. Refreshingly, some of these new generation of researchers don't have a background in scientism. Often they didn't even choose to research these strange elusive creatures, but were forced into it as families of Sasquatch who don't seem to have boundaries like you or I moved into their neighbourhood. One such researcher is Scott Carpenter. Well, 
When I started out, you know, I thought that if there was a Bigfoot, it was some sort of big large bipedal ape, and I expected an animal. And so when I first started my research, that's the mindset I had, well, smart ape, you know, a little bit more intelligent than your average animal, but when I first started researching, you know, I was setting up my cameras and stuff like I was to take pictures of deer. You know, I had no clue. You know, I was literally clueless of what I was really getting into or what I was doing. Yeah, and I think that's important to state because if you and I would have talked back a couple of years ago, I would have probably said you're nuts. It's nothing more than an ape. But if you take a serious look into the subject, there's something more going on here. There, it just is. I would love to be wrong on this. I don't think I am. Um, but after a while, you feel like you're chasing a ghost. I'm not saying Sasquatch is a ghost, but after so many years of being in it, it's like, God, why can't we get this evidence or that evidence? Or uh, why can't someone just put a bullet in one and drag it in? You know, I can kind of relate to that because it's like I put it in my book as one of the rules, but they always would do stuff that just enough for you to know. But if anyone else looked at that, they'd say that was a coincidence, that was a squirrel. Hang on a second. You know, that that's not right. You know, one of the things they used to do was very frustrating. I set these rocks out on this piece of marble, they, and they actually put it there. But anyway, I'd lay rocks in different patterns and see if they'd mess with them. They would mess with them, but it always left the doubt that someone could say, well, an animal did that. But one of the most interesting things they did, I would take real detailed pictures. You know, take my pictures, go back a week later on the next weekend, take more video, you know, and look, well, they didn't move the rocks. Well, then on one of them, for some reason, I noticed and one of the rocks had like a, a neck in it. The rock was in the same position as far as where it was on the marble slab, but it was turned 180 degrees the other way. And I started looking, and every rock had been turned 180 degrees. And you're thinking, now, come on. They'll do things that I know, uh, something of intelligence did, but if I put this in a video or if I tell a friend, they're going to look at me like I'm crazy. Uh, they finally moved the rocks into a pattern. I mean, I'd put a smiley face on a flat piece of rock, and it, it would just change into this pattern of a C, and above the C was a, another rock. And at first, I thought, that's weird. But then I had remembered uh, an interview a lady did and said they were using, uh, uh, what's that language? Uh, it's syllabus. And, you know, Indians, you know, many tribes use syllabus. It, it basically, each symbol represents a sound. And you put the sounds together to make words. So it was a syllabic symbol. And when I looked it up, I translated it a couple different ways. You know, if I used Cree and Cherokee, it formed a word like Vata or Wata. And then when you look that up, that means come visit brother, come visit friend. After the rock thing, I started, you know, I just started experiment with different forms of communication. I learned a little bit of Cherokee, and I would try to go out in the woods and speak. You know, I even experimented with sign language. I read accounts where the deaf child was signing into the woods, and the mother, father said, what were you doing? I was talking to the big hairy man, you know, using sign language, and he was talking back. I mean, other than talking in their language, me hearing the gibberish, the samurai chatter, and the mumbling, they yelled at me and David Plotties one time. And the, the so, language that you and David heard, was it like the Sierra sounds? Or was it similar? Yeah, it was similar to Sierra sounds. There's a guy called Ron Moorhead who for several years had a cabin way up in the remotest parts of the Sierras of Northern California. And he was there one time with a friend and uh, every evening they used to hear some absolutely bizarre noises and calls and they couldn't figure out what the hell it was. And um, so they took up a tape recorder one time, and this is what they recorded. (laughs) 
We decided to record the sounds and uh, put them on a CD and a cassette and make them available to people. And we do believe these creatures are trying to communicate with us, so we, as we speak, are having the linguistics uh, people look into it. They are very encouraged. What they're saying so far is that humans cannot mimic these sounds. The range uh, supersedes what a human can do. Uh, the tapes were shown by a previous study at the University of Wyoming to be uh, spontaneous and uh, no signs of being uh, re-recorded or pre-recorded at altered speeds. Mm -hmm. So the idea of a hoax is very improbable as far as professions are concerned at this time. It's amazing how your senses kick in up there. Uh, one night we were sleeping in this in the tent that we set up, but we were laying there, and uh, you know, about one o'clock in the morning, I heard this chatter right behind our tent. I was laying there with my tape recorder in my hand and my sleeping bag, and I heard this chatter. And the feeling I got was it was a young one talking to her mother across the creek, and uh, my tape recorder wasn't working then anyway, because I, otherwise I would have recorded it. That's what happens too. Uh, batteries go dead up there quite often. Mm -hmm. One of the other strange things. Ron will back me up on this. You can actually feel the difference when they're around and when they're not. I know that sounds paranormal. You don't like to go there, I but know exactly I mean, what you mean. There's, there's been times up there when me and Ron would sit down, drop their backpacks, and go, "Man, there's nothing going to happen this time." And then there's been times we drop our backpacks, and almost immediately, weird stuff starts happening. For a long time, me and Ron didn't even want to talk about it because it was just too weird and paranormal. Me and Ron took up such a redundancy of batteries. Brand new pack of batteries up there for our tape recorders and for Ron's video recorder. But whenever you had the feeling that they were around, you would put those batteries in and you could almost watch the battery indicator go down. You could almost watch them drain they almost immediately drain the batteries out of whatever it is we put them in. At times when we'd be up there and, you know, me and Ron would look at each other after we drop our packs and go, man, I don't feel a thing. But we would put those batteries in on my little Zoom recorder and they'd last recording for four days and 24 hours a day. Not a thing on them. How do you explain that? I think there's something going on with these things that requires energy or they can zap the energy or something's going on with energy and them. And I don't know what it is, but that's not unusual for that to happen. And I've had other people tell me that too. I've experienced it one time when I was out there and I didn't have an answer for it. So I didn't really go any farther than that. There's only one conclusion that me and Ron can draw. There's way more going on here than any of us ever expected. And like you said, you don't get it until you get up there and experience it for yourself. For the first few years, it was so weird that me and Ron had decided we're not going to talk about some of this stuff. But then it just got to the point to where we have to just be honest about the stuff we've experienced up there if we're going to get to the bottom of any of this. Ron, tell us about the, the weird thing that happened to you. I got to hear it. Oh, yeah. I took Carrie up there with another gentleman. And uh, that evening, I seen a probably... Oh, 30, 40 yards, you know, just to the uh, south of the old shelter area where we'd set up our tent. Here comes this elongated, tubular-looking light <laughs> floating through the trees. Controlled, definitely controlled, moving through the trees. Now, it was below the ridge line, so it couldn't have been an aircraft of any kind. Uh, plus, it wasn't blinking anyway, but we was inside the tent, but the fly was off because it was a nice night. Well, I said, hey, Carrie, I said, look at this. So we was watching watching this thing go by us, and we watched it for several seconds, so it went all the way down to, and I didn't know if it was going to come back up to the tent or if it was going to go away, but it, it went away. But um, this other gentleman, uh, he didn't see it. He was looking the other way in his hammock. He heard uh, tree knocks, several of them, uh, right after that. And then about midnight that night, he told us the next morning, he saw this he thought a hiker coming in on the trail with a headlamp on. And he said, he was walking right down towards our camp. I expected somebody to come walking in any time. And I told him, there's no trail up there. That's not how you get here. You can't even walk up in those rocks. 
He said, you've got to be kidding. So he went up there to look oh, next morning, looking all over those rocks, trying to find a track or trail of any kind, looking right. for some kind of a sign of somebody coming in. I explained to him a thing that can happen. Some eyes can collect enough light will reflect a cone when you want them to. That happens in young children a lot, but they grow out of it real quick. Uh, and I've actually heard a report of a man who saw this Bigfoot that had cones coming out of his eyes who was looking at the trail as he's walking. It sounded very credible when I read it. So I told this gentleman who was with us about that, and he said, oh, man, I can't, oh, no. <laughs> but uh, some people have cognitive dissonance. It's where new information comes in, and you can't explain it, so you don't accept it. <laughs> I'm sure that puzzles him even today. Very strange. It is very, very strange. strange, you know, and I get a lot of reports like that, uh, people seeing mm. these lights all the way up to the size of a small Volkswagen, and there's really no explanation for the lights at all. Somehow, some way, there are creatures that exist currently that are documented back going throughout history and going throughout time. So we got to figure out where they came from. And what, where they came from has to do with lights, UFOs, um, what people call stargates and things of that nature. I'm no expert on anything, but when, when you look into her eyes, first off, it's a connection. I, oh my God. When she locked into my eyes, it was very strange. My whole life was changing. It was like I was staring back into something that, that knew the secrets to everything. I, man, I know that sounds really odd, but it was like wisdom, but it was terrifying at the same time. I can't explain that, but I could tell. She was, she was so intelligent, so intelligent, more intelligent than, than, than anyone out there is giving them credit for. You can see wisdom when you really look into someone's eyes, you know, you can almost see their soul. And she just had a little soul, I guess, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. That, yeah, that's what it felt like to me. Yeah, no, and I, I appreciate sharing that. that. I don't think that's bizarre at all. In fact, I, I know exactly what you mean. Why do you think she didn't attack you? These things have understanding like you and I do. You could see it in their eyes. I mean, let's face it. If she was an animal, she'd kill her. I mean, that's what animals do. You know, when they, when they feel like they need to protect their young, a bear's not going to stop and go, oh, that's a human. I kill it. Animals have intelligence, right? You know, I can play with my dog, and eventually she could figure out that they're chasing me around the house. She could take a shortcut by hopping over a couch. But that's not that's not the same type of reason. These things actually think, understand, communicate. They have an ability and strength and power that that we just don't understand. But again, you know. When you look at children as an adult, you don't ever look at a child like, I want to kill you. As an adult person, you would never look at a child that way. It's such hatred for man, such disdain. Like, if I could kill you all right now, I would. Every one of you. And that's how I felt like she felt. There was no compassion in her eyes. She didn't look at us like, oh, look, kids. She looked at us like, I want you dead. And that's how I felt. I just felt like if she could kill every human being there was at that moment, she just would. Why do you think she didn't actually kill you guys? I feel like it's forbidden. Like she already knew the answer to that. She so badly wanted to, but knew that it was against the rules. I had a guy on from Florida and he had pulled up in a fishing boat and it's up on the shoreline and it's throwing a fit. I mean, absolutely throwing a fit. And he said it had this look. Actually, he's in the intro of the show. Had this look of, I just want to kill you. It rushed him. And it got within a few feet of him. And it stopped. And he couldn't figure out why it stopped. And they were just standing there looking at each other. And he said it was just pure pure hatred it had on its face. I mean, this thing wanted to kill him. Right. 
Why? Why was hatred? And I think it goes into what they are and why it's being covered up. I think you and I both agree it's not an ape. From talking to you for the audience listening, I'm not trying to like... No, you're correct. I don't feel like it's an ape. It's because it has hair covering its body and it's short. It's very gorilla-like, you know, from my experience. Very gorilla-like only in her hair and her ability to move her lips. Other than that, there was nothing gorilla about this creature. It's, I, in my opinion, it's, a, it's its own species. I don't feel like it's a missing link. I don't feel like it's connected to us that way. It's older than that. Look, it has ability, things that we can't do. It's not just a predatory ability. It, it's more than that. It's a control. It's, um, look, I didn't even see it. It was standing right in front of me. I didn't see it. This thing's like eight foot tall with a baby attached to its side. 40 feet in front of me in a clearing, nothing between us, not a thing. And I did not see it. My cousin didn't see it. It wasn't until I pointed at her and she actually moved that he could actually even see her. It was almost like she had control over, it was almost like she was just part of the environment. And I couldn't understand that. But, but I do understand it because I didn't see her. She's right in front of us probably for almost a minute, and I don't even know she's there. You know, I've talked to a guy who worked in the lumber industry. He was a logger, and he had walked away from the place where they were logging. He had to use a bathroom. So he starts peeing, looks up, and he, he sees what he thinks is a tree stump and just keeps peeing, and this tree stump stood up about eight feet tall. Oh, he wow. said it just kept going up and up and up and up. And he said he saw the tree stump several times and thought it was a tree stump until it stood up. I kind of get what you mean. I think more people probably have run across these things out there hiking than never even known they were there. Right. I, I got to tell you, um, it probably took me 20 years before I went back in the woods. There are times that I'm in the woods when everything's just fine and, and I don't feel like they're anywhere near. But there are other times... You know, and it doesn't happen often, very rarely. But uh, ever since that incident, I can go into the woods now, and if they're nearby, I'll feel them. I feel hypersensitive to them now. If I get that feeling, I'm out, Wes. I'm gone. I'm out. Time to go. It's like when I was in Texas, and we were out there before we had the log thrown at our head. I was telling the guys... They're here. I know they're here. Right. That was before we heard them, before we saw them. I just had the hairs on the back of my neck standing up, and then the vocals started, and then later we had a log thrown at us. But if you tell someone that, you almost sound like a kook. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and I don't have a great answer for that, but it, it is true, and I've talked to other eyewitnesses that feel that way. You know what I mean? I, I think there's a reason. You were asking me what I thought they were. They're older than us. That's what I think. I think they're much older than we are. And I think they know more than we give them credit for. I feel they don't belong here. All right. So they feel very biblical. Now, I don't mean biblical as in 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Right. I mean biblical as in... Biblical like the Nephilim? Like abominations, like they shouldn't be here? I think an abomination is a very good term. And I've said that I think that they're only flesh and blood creatures because I didn't want to get into this publicly. But then I'll say stuff like, well, you know, I kind of believe they're... Um, the spawn of fallen angels and things of that nature. And it doesn't contradict anything that I'm saying, um, but you just have to know the history. I'll just throw it out there. So when you look in the story of Noah in the Bible, the reason why Noah was put on the ark is because it said that Noah was perfect in all his generations. And that was a, the days and times when um, giants roamed the earth, which means that the human genome and the genetics of everything on the planet had been corrupted 
by the seeds of the fallen angels, so that's why the earth was flooded. It's consistent across pretty much every religion. It's Native American legend. They account the great flood. They're talking about flesh-eating giants and giants that they call cloud eaters. And then we know that after those floods, there were still some of these giant creatures and beings on the planet. What I'm about to read to you guys is from the Book of Giants. It's going to sound really choppy because the Book of Giants was found with the Dead Sea Scrolls and it was found in pieces. It's not a complete manuscript, but you'll get the picture, I think. It says 200 donkeys, 200 asses, 200 rams. Three flock, 200 goats, 200 beasts of the field from every animal, every bird for miscegenation. It's talking about what happened in Genesis 6, verse 4. Uh, the fallen angels coming and having sex with women of the earth, their offspring known as the Nephilim, these giant creatures. What it's talking about here is these things doing that with animals uh and it, when you keep reading here it says they defiled the they defiled blank 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 they begot giants and monsters they begot and beheld all the earth was corrupt with its blood and by the hand of giants which did not suffice for them and they were seeking to devour many the monsters attacked it now that that, that's with a lot of blanks. What I just read you, there's a lot of blanks to fill in there because it's in pieces. But when you read this and you apply it to the Genesis 6 narrative, it makes me wonder, is what people seeing remnant of what happened back then? And if that's true, would they hold supernatural capabilities like their fathers had? Fallen angels had supernatural capabilities. Is that what we're dealing with? But um, this encounter happened around after 8.30, between 9, 9.30. My best friend came by and nobody to babysit my son. So I told him, jump in, let's go up to Pine Top. Let's have a good time, got, got paid. So let's go spend some of my money. I wanted to have fun. So when we're heading up to Pine Top, there's a branch that's called Lester Oliver. And it's abandoned, nobody stays there. But anyways, about uh, half a mile from that little ranch, a, a wildfire had started and it burned up quite a bit of area in that area. But you could pretty much see through the trees. This burn had actually took out a lot of pine needles and shrubs. And anyways, we went past there and I had my headlight on and then I put it on high beam. And my son had said that he saw he thought it was a man walking up the mountain. And then when he looked closer, he realized it wasn't a man, that it was a tall, hairy creature walking up the hill. And his, his arms were way, way below his uh, knees. I'm, I'm still pretty shaken from what, what he told me had happened. I'm, I'm scared still. I, I haven't slept for the last couple of nights. Now, how, how old do you, did you say your son is? Ten. But anyways, he said that he had seen this creature. And I don't know how to explain this, but I'll say the best way that he told me was that it has talked to him in his mind. And he said that he was there walk beside that creature. That creature was hunting the deer, the mule deer. Then the mule deer put its head up and saw it, and it took off running, and he said that that creature ran after the deer. The mule deer ran straight, the creature ran up ahead, and it hid behind a tree. And when the mule deer ran by, that creature had a big rock in his hand and smashed that mule deer in the head, killed it. He said that he watched that creature 
grab the mule deer by the face with the right hand and drug it up, start carrying it up the mountain. And he said that the mule deer's uh, hoof got caught between the two rocks. And that's when the, the creature jerked the carcass and he said the back end of the hoof came off, pulled it so hard that there was blood all over the place. And he said he was right there watching it. My son was still sitting in the back seat, but yet he was there. He said it was kind of like it had taken his mind and had put him into that situation. And he said when he looked up, the creature was looking at my car and it didn't care, it wasn't afraid. And my son said that he kind of went into shock because he couldn't believe what he had witnessed. And he had told me that that creature's eyes had turned red, then it turned blue, then it turned orange. He said that those are three different colors that that creature's eyes had turned. And what he told me was that creature had started talking to him telepathically. Let's go and share this meal, dear. Let's you and me go up there and eat it together. Mm, you need to tell your and son to ignore this thing. I, I didn't know that this was I didn't know this was going on. I didn't even know that he had saw this this Bigfoot or whatever it was. I didn't know that. This could be a trick. Some, sometimes they, if they like lose a male in their own tribe, they'll come down and try to find a male to replace the male they lost. I don't know what y'all's spiritual beliefs are, but... Um... I wasn't raised on a reservation. I wasn't raised to the religion that they have within the Apache community. I, I wasn't raised that way. I was raised in a Christian family. I was I was always taught that these kinds of things don't happen. That these I, I knew that these Bigfoot existed because it's been known within our tribe. I believed it because my my dad would talk about it. He would always tell me, "Be careful when you go out at night. Don't go walking around by yourself because they call it a tall hairy man. He's walking around." might grab you and take you up into the mountains. He told me it's happened before that they would do that to young females. And I, you know, at the time I would laugh, but the older I got, the more I studied on it and heard people talking about it. And I'm still kind of shook up about this, but my son had said that this creature had invited him to go eat that deer with him. And he said a divine inner voice intercepted for him and told my son, don't go with him, don't pay attention to him, and go back into your body and don't, don't interact with this creature. That's when he snapped back into reality. 